Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so let's start. Any questions from last time? Uh, anybody tried the last assignment that I gave you? No? Uh, so what happens when you plug in your kernel density estimator into the K in, instead of the normal estimate into k-means? Yes, no? See, if you want to get maximum mileage out of this class, you have to do work. You cannot, uh, not a passive class. So, <coughs> if you remember, what we wanted to do last time is, we wanted to say, okay, if suppose I have, uh, instead of, uh, so my P of Y condition on X, I'm going to write this as P of Y P of X conditioned on Y over P of X, okay? And this, if I have, uh, if I have M samples, okay? And uh, M, Y of them come from the Yth class, then this is just M, Y over M, okay? And then P of X condition on Y, I'm going to write this as summation over all i such that yi is equal to y okay of 1 over r to the d or h to the d i don't remember what notation we are using so let's use h to the d k of x minus xi over h right? times and then this divided by 1 over and y, okay? And then P of X is nothing but 1 over M, summation over all I of 1 over H to the D, maybe we should call it J, K of X minus XJ over H, clear? So all we did is we substituted for P of X, we said this is our kernel density estimate for P of X. For P of X condition on Y, we just look at the points which are labeled y and substitute their uh, kernel density estimate. And for p of y, we are just taking the fractions. Okay. If you do this, then this cancels out. Okay. This cancels out. This cancels out. And what you are left with is basically summation of i, y equals y of k times x minus xi over h over some constant. I don't care what this constant is. This constant is this guy. Okay, it doesn't depend on <coughs> anything. In particular, if suppose I tell you that y is uh, has only two classes, right? So let's say if y is just plus one minus one. Okay, so if this were the this were just the two classes. So if you just had a binary classification problem, then what happens is your decision rule is if you remember your decision rule is arg max over y of p of y condition on x. Right? So you you predict with the class which has the maximum probability, the posterior probability. Okay, and so which means in our case we'll predict if p of y equals plus 1 condition on x is larger than p of y equals minus 1 condition on x, then you'll predict plus 1, otherwise minus 1, right? Or I can write this as if this minus this is bigger than 0, then you predict this as plus 1, otherwise you predict this as minus 1. So now what is p of y equals plus 1 minus p of y equals minus 1 according to this formula, right? 
So according to this formula, if I plug this in, okay, what happens is this is nothing but you can write this as summation of y i, okay, k of x minus x i over h over a constant is bigger than equal to zero. Then you predict plus one, otherwise you predict minus one. Is this clear? So if I had many classes, then this is the general formula. I'm specializing this formula for two classes. Okay, so if I so suppose I told you that instead of multi-class, I just have want to use the same formula for doing a binary classification problem. So if suppose my y was just plus one or minus one, then you remember what was my decision rule? My my k-means uh, for sorry my k nearest neighbor decision rule was. I take p of y condition on x, look for all possible y, take the y which has the largest probability and predict that, correct? So that was my rule was argmax over y of p of y condition on x. So I find the maximum y which has the maximum posterior probability and then I predict that, right? So this is my prediction. This is my prediction y star, okay? Now in the case when you have just two uh, classes, plus one and minus one, then what happens to this argmax, right? So the argmax simply says that if p of y equals plus 1 is larger than p of y equals minus 1, then you should predict plus 1. And otherwise, you should predict minus 1. Or equivalently, I can write this as if p of y equals plus 1 minus p of y equals minus 1 is bigger than 0, then it must be plus 1. But what is this condition? p of y equals plus 1 means what? I have to take all this summation over all the plus classes and I had to subtract from it the summation over all the minus class okay but that I can write compactly as summation over y i times k of x i minus x i over c clear that's all I'm doing and this you can think of this as the weight that is given by the ith point to the location x correct so this is, not, this is nothing but a weight factor, right? So this is, this depends, what does it vary on or what does this thing depend on? This only depends on x and xi, clear? So it depends on what is the distance between x and xi and uh, so you can think of this as point x, oops, point x is giving you a weight uh, sorry, point xi is giving you a weight at location x, right? So it tells you how close or far away you are. Depending on that, this is wi, that's the weight. The weight of the ith point at location x. And you are just summing this weight by multiplying it with yi. So in other words, what you are saying is, all the positive points are going to give me positive weight. All my negative points are going to give me negative weight. If the positive weight is larger than the sum of negative weights, then it is plus 1. If the sum of positive weights is smaller than the negative weights, then it is minus 1, clear? So this is also, you can think of this as some sort of a weighted linear classifier. So you are just simply saying that every point gives you a vote. The vote of that point depends on the distance of that point from x. So if you want to predict at location x, you see who is close to you and what weights are they giving you, correct? Are the weights positive or negative? If the overall sum of weights is positive, then you predict plus 1. If not, it's minus 1. Okay. So now we will go into the next part. And this is, some part of it is going to be fairly mathematical, unfortunately. You cannot help that. But uh, the nice thing about what we are going to talk about today, is that provides a very unified view of uh, looking at things. And it allows you to do many, many things in a, in a rather unified way. You don't have to look at individual distributions, but you can talk about an entire family of distributions. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's a caveat. So please pay attention because the math is, it is math heavy, but again, the math is important. Okay, and again, if, if something is not clear, uh, please ask me because I can, I can go over it as slowly as you want. But really, I want you to get this. If you get this, uh, you know, the rest of the course is sort of becomes much, much, much more easier. Okay? But if you don't get this, the rest of the course is going to be quite hard. So uh, stop me anytime 
anything is not clear okay so so far we did non parametric density estimation right so where we said we don't make any assumptions about the functional form of the density we are simply going to do sophisticated counting so we're just going to take data and we are going to let the data speak for itself the other paradigm in uh, machine learning is you say i'm going to assume a functional form for my density okay and then i'm going to estimate the parameters this is very different and this is placing a very strong assumption right so the assumption is that the uh, the, uh, the underlying assumption is that you are somehow assuming that you know the functional form from which the density was drawn okay or you are you are making a very strong modeling assumption there that maybe it is drawn from a gaussian it's drawn from a poisson it's drawn from some distribution this may or may not be true but what you are saying is assume that that is ground truth i'm going to estimate my parameters okay so that is your uh, that's a fundamental shift in thinking and in order to do that of course you may have gone to courses you may have done machine learning courses in the past where they say okay you know i'm going to assume that data is drawn from a gaussian and let's go and derive the equations for a gaussian or they may say oh well, let's go and do it for a bernoulli and whatever right instead what we are going to do is slightly different what we will do is i'll introduce you to a family of distributions and it turns out that this family of distribution is very powerful in the sense that almost any named distribution that you can think about belongs to this family okay so we'll see a few examples of these kinds of distributions which belong to the family and then i'll give you unified ways of dealing with all members of this family okay and that is what is the beautiful thing about it so what is this family of distribution that i'm talking about it's called the exponential family and the functional form of this distribution looks like this so i'm going to say p of x condition so this is a parametric family okay so which means it is always parameterized by something so p of x condition on theta is some p not of x times and uh, don't worry i'll explain each thing in great detail okay so first of all you have to note that this is a parametric family of distributions and this is the parameter what do you mean by parametric family of distributions which means think of something like a gaussian right so a gaussian has a functional form you know the functional form and the parameters are the mean and the variance so if you specify to me the mean and the variance you have completely specified the distribution to me okay so in the same way if you specify the parameter theta to me you have specified this distribution okay and this uh, this parametric family of distributions this thing phi of x is called the sufficient statistics okay sometimes in machine learning terms we all will also call this features okay so this is simply saying that x could belong to any domain it doesn't matter what domain x belongs to and that's a that's an important distinction so x could come from any domain for instance x could be strings trees graphs vectors whatever it is phi of x is a function which takes x and spits out a vector okay so this vector could be whatever dimension and there's another very important thing um i although i'm just mentioning it here we'll see more about this when we look at support vector machines phi need not be finite dimensional okay so that's one thing to keep in mind this is a usual dot product so whenever i use this okay in the course this means it's a dot product Okay. Right now, I'm just thinking of the Euclidean dot product. So, just think of uh, this is a this is a vector in some d-dimensional space. Theta is a vector in some d-dimensional space, and this is a dot product between theta and x. Just the normal Euclidean dot product, right, which is nothing but theta transpose phi of x, which is defined as theta i phi i of x. Okay. but when we go to look at support vector machines and other fancy algorithms this will become a more sophisticated dot product so i i will leave this notation here instead of using this notation i'll use this notation this is deliberate okay this is called the log partition function okay 
the name for this function actually comes from physics and we'll see in a minute why uh, it's a, this is a very very important function and sort of uh, you know it's a, it's a heart and soul of the of the exponential family and the log partition function as you can imagine is a normalizing function what do you mean by normalizing function you know that this is a density right so what is the property of a density the property of a density is that so what's the property of a density If I do this, it should be 1, right? Because it's a density, it must integrate out to 1. So what the log partition function does is it ensures that this density integrates out to 1. Okay? So if you do this, actually it turns out, if you write this expression, it's fairly easy to figure out what the log partition function is. Because P of x given theta can be written as P naught of x, x above phi of x times theta over x puff g of theta dx integral right but this is a this is independent of x right whatever is being integrated is x not theta so i can take this out okay and i i can bring it to the other side so this is nothing but x puff g theta or if I apply log transform on both sides, this is my, okay. So my log partition function therefore has a functional form, okay. Now there are a few things to keep in mind, okay. This while it looks nice and easy that it has a functional form, there is a very big hidden danger or there is a very big hidden um, problem in this expression. Okay, the big hidden problem in this expression happens to be this integral. What does this mean? It means you have to integrate something over the entire space. Okay, suppose you are modeling the space of all documents. It means you have to do this integration over the space of all possible documents. Or suppose you are doing this x is some d dimensional vector. Which means you have to do this integral over the entire vector, entire vector space. Okay, of d dimensions or whatever is the domain of definition of x, you need to do this integral. Okay, and this usually causes problems. This will we'll see a lot of examples of where this causes problems. But there are also there are also some very nice properties of this function we'll talk about. But I just want to point out this. Okay, so this is called the log partition function, and this is called the base measure. Okay, so the base measure I'm just going to, for most part, I'm just going to assume. A standard Lebesgue measure. Okay, so it doesn't. It's it's a it's a standard. It's some some standard measure. I'm not. I'm just going to ignore it. You can keep it round. It keeps on adding constants and makes the equations messy. But for most part, I'm just going to assume that this is just a constant. It's a base. It's a it's a Lebesgue measure. Okay. But in some cases, it's very important. So this is especially important when you're looking at discrete domains. For instance, there you don't have a Lebesgue measure and you have to work with some other measure. But uh, whenever there is an exception, I'll talk about it. But for most part, you can ignore this. Okay, just assume that this is just some constant density. Okay, so on. The, otherwise, all this is telling you is that how does your how do you do sampling in your actual space? Like if you're looking at the space of documents, how do you do sampling in that space? So don't don't worry about this for now. Okay, and uh, <coughs> this scary distribution family, I claim is a, a abstraction of almost any density that you can think of, any name density that you can think of, more or less. Okay. So examples that belong to this family include binomial. I'll show you how the, uh, so Bernoulli, by <coughs> Bernoulli multinomial beta, gamma, mm, uh, Gaussian, Poisson, all these distributions belong to this family. What do I mean by belong to this family? Which means that there is a representation phi of x and there is a parameter theta such that the distribution, the way you write it can be massaged to be written in this form. That's what I mean by the, it belongs to the exponential family. Okay? So let, let me go and show you an example first, a very, very simple example of the Bernoulli. 
So what I'm going to assume is my space X just contains two points, zero and one. Okay, so heads or tails or zero or one. And I'm going to assume that phi of X is simply going to be X. Okay, so this is this uh, this is my space. That is my sufficient statistics. And now I need to estimate g of theta. Okay, so what is g of theta? It is the log of the integral. So here the space contains only two points, right? Which is zero and one. Since it contains two points, I don't need an integral. I can just do a summation. Okay, so it's the log of p naught I'm just going to ignore which is the x of x times so in this case x is equal to plus 1 or 0 times theta plus x of 1 times theta correct so what is x of 0 times theta right so this whole thing is just 1 and what is x of 1 times theta is just x of theta right so this is going to be my log partition function it's log of 1 plus x of theta and what is my density going to be p of x equals 1 condition on theta is just going to be x of theta over 1 plus x of theta and p of x equals 0 condition on theta is going to be 1 over 1 plus x of theta. Clear? Now if you give me any Bernoulli distribution with parameter p, right, I am just going to set this to be equal to p and solve for theta, right, which I can always do and this is exactly equal to 1 minus p. Clear? So any Bernoulli distribution can be rewritten in this form. Similarly, this is a good exercise to try out. Okay, I'm, I, I won't do the math, but again, you can either look it up in the book or try it out on your own. If you set phi of x to be x and x x transpose, things one. Okay, if you set your phi of x to be this, and if you set your theta to be the following thing: sigma inverse mu and sigma inverse. Okay. If you set your phi of x to be this guy and theta to be this, it turns out what distribution will you get? We will get a Gaussian. Okay. And similarly, you can try for other things. So there are the multinomial, Poisson, all of that. Okay. So the point here is, while it seems like we are doing a lot of work, right? I mean, this seems like why do we want to, why do we want to you know, take a simple distribution like the Bernoulli, which we all know and understand and love so well, and try to write it in this very complicated form involving exponentials and g of theta and all of that. What advantage do we get out of this? Right? That's a question that we need to ask, and we'll answer that. Okay? We'll answer this question by saying that we can say many things about the entire family. Okay? We can say many things about this entire family of distributions in one shot. We can handle all of them in one shot. We don't have to worry about individual distributions. We don't have to think about oh, what happens for the Gaussian, what happens for the Bernoulli, what happens for the Poisson. I can give you statements that apply for any kind of modeling right, that, you, that you use. So questions before we go on and find properties about this distribution, discuss properties. I mean, I'm sure that all of you are wondering about why do we need this complicated expression, but that I will answer. But other than that, anything about the functional form, anything that's not clear. Okay, there's one thing that I do want to point out. So what is it? What? Uh, so sort of, you have to understand this two-step process in some sense when you're working with exponential families of distribution. What is the two-step process? If you select phi of x, what does that mean? So if I fix a phi of x, if I tell you that phi of x is something, what does that mean? That means that you're fixing a functional form for the distribution. Okay, it's like saying, if I tell you that I'm going to use this as my phi of x, okay, 
then I'm fixing a certain functional form, which means that I am saying that now I'm going to work with Gaussian distributions. Okay? And having fixed phi of x, when I select a theta, what does it mean? I'm picking a particular member of that functional form. Right? So, so saying I'm looking at the Gaussian distributions. How do you say that I'm going to look at Gaussian distributions? You say that by saying I'm going to fix this phi of x. There's an equivalent definition, which is you can tell me that I'm going to use this particular g of theta. Actually, it turns out they're equivalent. And uh, there are some mild technical conditions about dimensionality. But if modulo that, if you either tell me g of theta or you tell me phi of x, they are one and the same. You're telling me what is the form, what is the functional form you're going to use. And then the challenge is to find the theta, like this, right? So that the theta fixes a member of the family. You see the two-step distribution? So you can say, I'm going to work with Gaussian distributions. You specify phi of x, or you specify g of theta to me. Now I say, okay, now fine, you're working with Gaussian distributions. Tell me which particular Gaussian distribution do you want to work with? Then you have to tell me what are your parameters theta. Clear? So you have to tell me that, oh, I'm going to work with a Gaussian which has, say, zero mean and unit variance. Then you're telling me that this is a particular member. Correct? So there's a two-step process. So when you think about it in this two-step process in machine learning, what happens is that fixing phi of x or fixing g of theta is the modeling part. Right? So you're saying that I want to use a particular kind of distribution because I know something about where the data came from or I know something about the underlying process that's generating the data. That's the modeling part. And then once you have decided on the distribution family or the functional form, then finding the parameter theta which say best explains the data that you have observed is the actual parameter estimation part. Okay, so there's a two-stage distinction. So sort of, yeah, that's MLE, MAP, we'll see many different ways of estimating parameters. So this is where the sort of domain knowledge in some sense comes in. And this is finding the theta is where you are actually instantiating the model on the data that you have. Okay, so you see these two distinctions, right? That's that's important. <coughs> any any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Say that the elements of phi of x they don't be numbers. I mean, they can be of the complete different things. Like for example, here x is a vector, where yeah. and x x transpose is a matrix. Yeah. So the similar product or odd product is not complete. No, no. So what? Ha okay. So that's a good point. So the re the way the dot product here works is that you take a trace. So this is uh, x x transport with sigma inverse. So that's how you define the dot product. That's why I did not want to write this just simply as a Euclidean dot product. I wanted to have the flexibility to just say it is any dot product, because I mean, you know, if I want to be pedantic and use a use that then what I have to do is there is an operator which I have to apply which is called the VEC operator. So what it does is it takes a matrix and flattens it out into a vector. And then I can do the same thing. To this. No, 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 this will come out to be the trace. So you can verify this. So if you, if you take a matrix and flatten it out and you take another matrix and flatten it out, then you get a trace. But in general, that's a good point, right? So in general, this can be an arbitrary dot product, right? And that is another thing actually we'll see how to play around with. So this is another knob that we have to tune or we have a handle on is by changing the dot products, you can change the distribution and the family, the space in which it is living. Okay? And that gives you uh, additional handle. That is basically what we'll do when we start working with kernels. Okay? Any other questions? So yeah, I'm for the most part I'm ignoring P naught of x. I'm just going to assume that it's a Lebesgue measure because we're going to deal with continuous spaces. But P naught of x is very important. Like for instance, when you look at a Poisson distribution, Poisson is on a discrete space. Then you have to have a proper uh, a proper base measure. So uh, that's why I'm sort of sweeping it under the rug. But yes. 
If you really want to specify everything, you have to tell me what is the p naught of x, what is the phi of x, or g of theta, one of the two. But I'm just going to assume that it's a it's a uniform Lebesgue measure, just just because otherwise what happens is in all the calculations that I do, they there'll be always a constant hanging around, and I just I'm lazy enough not to write that. Okay. So other questions? Okay. So this is quite. This, it turns out that these families of distribution have remarkable properties. I mean, they're amazing properties that this, uh, this family of distribution has. And I just want to give you a flavor of some of them. Okay. So the first property that I want to talk about, and most of these properties come from the, from the um, log partition function itself. Oh, and the reason it's called the log partition function is because exponential families are also widely used in statistical physics and this is uh, uh, an integ integral over all energy states of a system and so that's why it is called log partition function the name comes from physics okay so they they were they used to use exponential family quite a bit okay so let's see some some remarkable properties of this function g of theta so the very first property of this function is let me take the gradient of this function okay, with respect to theta. So if I take the gradient, it turns out that let me just do this mechanically okay, and then you will see this. So there is again there is a caveat. Whenever you have integrals and differentials, you have to be very careful about uh, when you can you can swap the integrals and the differentials. Okay, so it's a, you have to uh, you have to either show something like dominated convergence or you have to show a technical property before you can swap an integral and differential. You can't just take an integral and swap it with a differential. But for our purpose, I'm just going to throw caution to the winds. Okay, and this is I mean it's not entirely technically correct what I'm doing. Uh, because I have to show you an argument to show that I can do this swap, but I'm not going to show you that argument because I just want to show you the intuition. Okay, so if I take the gradient, this is simply going to be the gradient of the log is nothing but let me get rid of the p naught. So this is just x. <coughs> and now this is where. I had to swap the integral and the differential, but I'm just going to assume that I can do that. Okay. Okay. So this is just I take the I'm just applying chain rule, right? So I take the the gradient of the log is one over x, so that is one over this guy, and then I get the gradient of this integral of x of phi of x times theta. I'm swapping the the integral and the differential, so I get the integral of the gradient of x of phi of x times theta. Again, applying the chain rule, I get the gradient of x is just x itself, and the gradient of phi of x times theta is phi of x. Okay, so this is just simple application of the chain rule for computing gradients. And what is this equal to? This is phi of x, p of x condition theta. Yeah. And what is this quantity? Anybody recognize this? Anybody? This is the expected value. Right, so this is the expected value under the distribution of phi of x. <coughs> so, if you take the first derivative of g of theta, you get the expected value of the sufficient statistics under p of x given theta. Or, oh, by the way, they are called sufficient statistics because, like I told you, if you specify phi of x, you are specifying the functional form. So, in some sense, they are sufficient to fix the functional form. That's why they're called sufficient statistics. The gradient of g of theta gives you the expected value of phi of x under the distribution. Okay. 
this is why is this a useful result because something funny something better happens if i take the second derivative of g of theta okay what do you expect to see it turns out that you get the second moment of the distribution okay and then if you take the nth derivative of g of theta you get the nth moment of the distribution okay again this follows this is something that i want you to try so that's why i'm not doing it but again like i told you to get the maximum value out of this course you have to go and do some of these things on your own okay it's not enough to just sit here and look at the board you have to try some of this so i won't do this but something very fun fundamental happens you get the second moment get the variance it's a variance under the distribution of phi of x and so on and so forth so if you can show that if you take the nth moment you'll get the nth moment and because of this property the log partition function is also called the generating function okay it's called the moment generating function Now, why is this moment generating property very useful to us? Right? Uh, so, first, first of all, this says that if you want to get any moments of the distribution, just take the log partition function, just keep on differentiating, and you'll get the moments. Okay. But why is this moment generating property of particular interest to us? Is because of this result. Okay. This result is very, very significant to us. So the the second derivative of g of theta is the Hessian of g of theta, okay. And the variance is a matrix, okay. What kind of matrix is the variance? What properties does the variance have? Symmetric, Symmetric and positive semi-definite or positive, right? So this matrix is symmetric. And positive, so I, I write positive semi definite, but it could be positive. So, this is a symmetric positive semi definite matrix. So, if you remember the review that Pratik did, what is a positive semi definite matrix? All its eigenvalues are bounded away from 0. Okay? For a positive definite matrix and for a positive semi definite matrix, they are all non negative. So, some eigenvalues could be 0, but all of them are non negative. <coughs> Now, if I tell you that the Hessian of a function is positive semi-definite, what does that tell you about the function? Anybody knows this? The function is convex. So, we will talk a lot about convex functions later in the course, uh, maybe even next week. But one of the neat properties of convex functions is that, so what are convex functions? Intuitively, they are functions which look like this, they look like a bow. Okay? even in high dimensions, whatever dimensions you go to, they look roughly like this. One of the neat properties of a convex function is that there is a unique global minimum. So when you minimize these functions, you'll always get a unique global minimum. Okay? We'll talk a lot more about the properties of convex functions. That is sort of almost half the course will be based on this. But for now, all we conclude from here is that this is a moment generating function. The log partition function is moment generating. Plus, for us, the most important thing is that it is convex. And the reason we care about it being convex is because, as I told you, when you minimize a convex function, you will get a unique global solution, a unique global minimizer. Why is that important? Suppose I give you a function which looks like this, nasty function which looks like this. Okay. If you go ahead and minimize this function, it's very hard intuitively. First of all, it's very hard because you know the function itself wriggles and does all kinds of things. Second of all, it's very hard to find out whether you are at the global optimum or not. Right? If suppose I gave you this point, this is a local optimum. You don't know whether this local optimum is it or does the function actually have a value below this. There's no way to find out. But for a convex function, if I tell you that this point is the global minimum, you can immediately go and verify that this is a global minimum. Okay? And we'll talk a lot more about why this is an important property. But for now, for this lecture, this is all that you need. Okay? The fact that for a global, for, for a convex function, not only can you find a global minimum, but you also have a certificate. So you can, somebody cannot fool you. 
if I tell you that the function is convex and then here is the solution or here is the minimum value of the function, they cannot fool you. You can immediately verify and say no, you are lying to me or you are correct. If somebody gave you a non-convex function and said this is the local minimum, you have no way of, uh, this is the global minimum, you have no way of checking that. Okay, so that is very important. So for our purpose, therefore, this is what we care about, that g of theta is convex. Why does this matter to us? Because now I can make some very, very fundamental claims about doing estimation or doing modeling with the exponential families. Okay, so now let me show you this. Before gone, questions? Questions, comments? So either I'm doing a fantastic job or nobody is following. <laughs> so Rishi, one question. Yeah. All this thing assumes a function is continuous and how does it apply to the discrete space when you talked about Poisson distribution and <coughs> the <Bernoulli. coughs> So this is in the parameter space, right? So x is x is discrete, but the parameters need not be, right? So like for instance here is an, like we saw the Bernoulli was an example, right? The, the, the space is discrete because it's only 0, 1, but the parameters need not be discrete, right? Because the theta could be anything because you see p was equal to 1 over 1 plus x of theta, right? So the, the range of theta is from 0 to infinity. Right. Other questions? So this is, yeah, it's a way, you have to make that distinction because everything is happening in the, in the, um, you know, in the space of theta. Any other questions? Okay. So now let us actually see some, pro, uh, like I have been promising you to show some amazing properties of these functions. I think I have just enough time to do that. So let us try to use these functions. Right? So suppose I give you some data, right? so our usual setting that we did last time as well. So I give you data, so I give you data x1 to x, I don't know what do I call it, I should use some notation. My notation may not be consistent across lectures, but at least hopefully it will be consistent within the lecture. Okay, so given some data, x1 to xm, and you are going to make an assumption that this data is drawn from some exponential family distribution. Okay, and uh, you you know you fix up a phi. So like I said before, you are going to fix a phi. You are going to say I am going to assume that this data was drawn from a distribution whose functional form I know. That's what you're saying when you fix phi, okay? And now my task is to find the best parameter theta that explains this data, right? So you remember the MLE thing that uh, Pratik was talking about, right? So we're going to do MLE with this exponential family. So we're going to assume that this data is drawn from this distribution. And now I'm going to ask, tell me what is the most likely parameter that would have generated the data that I observed. So I observed some data. Tell me what's the most likely parameter, okay? So for that, I have to write the, so let me call this capital X. So I have to write capital X condition on theta. And because I tell, I'm assuming the usual assumption that the data is drawn IID from this distribution. So this is just nothing but a product P of Xi condition on theta, I going from one time, hmm? IID assumption. Okay, which can also be because I'm going to assume this exponential family. This is nothing but i equals one to m of x of phi of x i times theta minus g of theta. Okay, and this can be written as x of summation i going from one to m phi of x i times theta minus m times g of theta and instead so this is the <coughs> likelihood so i can take the negative log likelihood right so if i take the negative log of this likelihood what do i get i get this plus this right this is my negative log likelihood so what am i saying 
if so what how do you read this expression the way you read this expression is suppose you are assuming a parameter theta how likely is it that this data was generated by an exponential family with phi of x how likely is it that this data was generated so say for more more concretely suppose you are assuming that you are working with a gaussian so your phi of x is x and uh, x x square then you are saying that suppose if i assume that the mean of the gaussian is 0 and the variance is 1 how likely is it that this zero mean unit gaussian variance is to have generated this data for every parameter you can say that right so for every gaussian you can ask how likely is it that this gaussian generated this data that i observe and what you do in a, and by writing the negative now what you are doing is in mle you will say among all possible gaussians i am going to select that gaussian which is most likely to have generated this data that is the maximum likelihood estimation principle. So, you are saying among every Gaussian has a certain probability to have generated this data, right? Because I can say, however likely or unlikely, I can I can do this. So, say if my data was one dimensional, so if I had data is look like this, if I gave you a Gaussian whose mean and variance look like this, this is also likely to have generated this data. And if I give you another Gaussian, say which looks like this. Okay. There is also a certain probability that this Gaussian generated this data. So, I am saying among all possible Gaussians, find me the one that most likely could have generated this data. You see the question? <coughs> or equivalently I can say because log is a monotonic transform, I can say if I take the negative log, take this expression and minimize it. Okay. Yeah. Maximize this probability or take the negative log of this probability and minimize it because log is a monotone transform it doesn't change anything okay so now if i take this quantity what does this tell me this tells me that i have to minimize okay this quantity say g of theta minus 1 over m summation phi of x i I can divide and multiply by m which is a constant so it does not matter. So, I have to minimize this quantity ok. This we already know is a convex function ok. This is a linear function of theta ok. This is just a dot product. So, it is a linear function. Summation of linear functions are still linear. Multiplying by constant still preserves linearity. So, this overall function is a linear function of theta. This is a convex function and you subtract a linear function. If you know anything about convex functions, immediately you know that convex minus linear is still convex. Since this overall function is convex, what do we know about the minimi minimization procedure? We know that the minimum exists, the minimum is globally unique, correct? So, we can and, and actually in fact, I will show you, we will have lectures on this on optimization, show you that finding the minimum is also easy. It is not just that, it is not just a theoretical existential criteria, it is not just saying oh there exists a minimum, you can find the minimum easily. Okay. So, now think about what something profound has happened. What is it that has happened? I did not make any assumption about phi of x. Right? I did not tell you this is a Gaussian, I did not tell you it is a Poisson, I did not tell you it is a Bernoulli, I did not say any, any of that, multinomial none of this. For any member of the exponential family, this result holds true. Okay? Which means that whenever you do maximum likelihood estimation with a member of the exponential family, there is a unique global solution. This is amazing if you think about it. right? I give you some data, any arbitrary Gaussian, I am just going to say assume that a Gaussian generated this data, any arbitrary Gaussian could have generated this data, right? infinitely many possibilities. But what this is telling me is that there is one unique Gaussian right, which will best explain the data. Okay, very, very powerful statement and it does not matter whether it is Gaussian, it is Poisson, it is multinomial, it is beta, 
any of these distributions. You could assume that this data was generated by any of these distributions and there is always a unique solution. Okay. So instead of going to 10 classes and attending all of them and <laughs> learning about each distribution, by doing a little bit of math, you can do this in an abstract way. Okay. And this is the beauty of the exponential functions. This is the beautiful thing about doing this in abstract. Okay. There is even more. So let me show you one property before we stop for today, which is now let's try to understand how does this minimum look like? Okay. Or what is the properties of this minimum? Like what does this argument, uh, the minimizer, what does the theta that minimizes this expression look like? Okay. So how do I do that? Let me take the gradient and set it to 0. Okay. If I take the gradient and set it to 0, what do I get? summation phi of x y is equal to 0 or this. Okay. What is this quantity? Sorry? Yeah, but when you divide it by 1 over m, is the average, right? It is the empirical mean of the sufficient statistics, of the data that you observed. So you get x1 to xm data, you compute the sufficient statistics, sum them, 1 over m. This is like the empirical average. So what does this tell you? You try and what do you know about this quantity? This has to be the expected value, right? <coughs> this is the expectation of phi of x under the distribution p of x condition on theta. So, what this tells you is that when you have found the optimum theta, that theta will have the property that the expectation of phi of x under the distribution will match the, the empirical expectation or the empirical mean of the data that you observe. It's a very pleasing property, right? It sort of makes sense. It says that when you come up with an estimate, what you get as an expected value of phi of x. In other words, the mean of that estimate is equal to the empirical mean that you observed in the data. Sort of makes it satisfying. <coughs> and also it turns out that for a maximum likelihood estimation in the exponential family, you can show rates. You can show that, oh, if I give you this much amount of data, then your estimates will have this much probability or this much confidence of being away from the true optimum. So you can, you can give rates on that. However, things are not all very rosy with a maximum likelihood estimate. Okay? One of the biggest problems of the maximum likelihood estimate is that it relies entirely on the data in some sense. Which means if you give me data which has outliers, immediately the maximum likelihood estimate starts having trouble. Okay, I'll give you one example and we'll, we'll work this out in the next lecture. Suppose, let's say I observe some data okay, and all the observations, uh, say I give you say 1000 observations which are all between 0 and 1 okay, and I give you one observation which by mistake happens to be 10,000. Okay. So there was some error in your observation process or somewhere when you were uh, shuffling the data, this happened. Okay. And suppose you are using a maximum likelihood estimate, say even with, an, with a Gaussian, what will be your estimate for mean? Right. Your estimate for mean will be somewhere here. This is completely bogus right? because one point should not get you so far away from the rest of the data. But unfortunately that is what happens with MLE. And we will talk more about it, I will give you an example, we will work this out and then I will show you why MLE has certain problems and why you need to fix MLE in some sense. There are things that you need to do in order to fix MLE. So we will talk about that in the next class. Okay. Questions? But just think about, I mean again the key takeaway from this class is that yes, it is painful to write things as an exponential family. Sometimes it takes a bit of effort. Good thing is that a lot of this has already been done. So if you pick up any old statistics book, 
you know, you can see a lot of different name distributions that you know about already written out in this form. They'll also give you what is the phi of x, what is the g of theta for each of these. So that's actually a very nice thing. So things like Bernoulli uh, uh, multinomial Dirichlet. One notable name distribution which does not belong to the exponential family is the student's tree distribution. Student's tree distribution does not belong to the exponential family. The reason for it is exponential family distributions always have um, very, uh, very uh, light tails. They, they decay very fast. Okay, but uh, student's t has a heavy tail distribution. It does not decay very fast. Okay, and so that's one of the limitations of the exponential family. But otherwise, there's a variety of distributions which fall in the exponential family. And for all of them, you can make these two statements. You can say that the log partition function for all of them is convex, is moment generating. And if you do MLE with them, you'll get a unique global solution. And that global solution will have the property that the expected expectation of phi of x will match the empirical expectation. Okay? These are the properties of the exponential family for every member of the exponential family. Next time we'll do MLE, MAP, Bayesian estimates, conjugate priors. We'll do a lot more with them. Okay. And we'll also post the homework, hopefully by today, I'll post the homework. We're just trying to get the data all in one place and write, do a write-up on what you exactly need to do. Okay, questions? Comments? Let's all go for lunch. Questions from Hyderabad? How can you say which family of the exponential family fits best? Okay, so that's a modeling question. Okay, so that's exactly where, um, you know, you as a modeler or a machine learner have to figure out what, uh, what your phi of x is. Right, so that's, uh, and that is also an inherent issue in general with all parametric families, uh, all parametric uh, methods for estimating distributions is you have to make an assumption, you have to make a modeling assumption that I know the distribution family. So other questions? Okay, so in that case, let's, yeah, there's a question. Sorry? For this, uh, the, the notes should be posted uh, on their homepage for the second chapter. So just look at them. Maybe today morning or something they would be posted. So have a look at them. Other questions? Okay, good. Let's break for lunch. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.